You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Fend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Magic. Yeah, it's magic. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, yes, drop my first F-bomb right off the bat. Yeehaw. Yeah, it's a wackadoodle Wednesday. What do you expect? Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. Also on the RLMRadio.xyz site and lots and lots and lots of other RLM places, including the Spreaker channel. And if you're listening in on Spreaker, please come on over to RLM, RealLibertyMedia.com. Think up a nickname. Join the chat. Give me static there because, trust me, I have tin can and kite string internet, as you could tell by the... uh, kind of stuff going on (laughs) yeah my internet is not exactly the greatest in the world but it wakes and so i'm not gonna bitch too awful much i might i might whine a little bit but it's magic fuck you (laughs) oh i love that comedian oh well let's see where am i at (laughs) i'm all choked up I've been playing in a dusty garage. Yay. That's what I've been doing. I've been helping my Uncle Tommy. Because he needs help cleaning out the garage. (laughs) Grandpa saved a lot of stuff. (laughs) Okay, over here on Mines. I'm not real sure who is over here on Mines. But hi, everybody over here on Mines. I didn't make it over to the RLMNUMNUMNUM page. to, uh, And I may just do that right quick. Um... There we are. No. Oh, shit. (laughs) Stutter fingers are us. (laughs) Just in case y'all are wondering, yeah, I'm kind of a hick. (laughs) Okay. There. Now, I... I reminded it real quick. So, hey there, everybody over on Minds, if you're listening in. Come on over, give a listen, do some shouting. I don't care. You can shout all you want. Um, over here on Fakey Book, let's see. Do I see anybody playing along over here? <gasps> Jeanette, what's going on, Jeanette? Oh, my God, I got added to. Apparently, somebody seems to think. Oh, <laughs> yes, Jeanette. On Fakey Book, we have been friends for eight years. And other than that, we've been friends since we were five. That's a long time. I'm not telling you how long ago that was. <laughs> long enough. Long enough. Um, over half a century. Let's just put it that way, shall we? Okay. Um, other than that, not a whole heck of a lot going on over here on Fakey Book. It has been rather slow, or at least for me, it's been slow. I don't know if it's because I'm being shadow banned or what the hell the deal is. Um, Twitter has been quite slow for me of late as well. I think it's probably all those rants and raves that I won on when uh, that whole thing with Alfie and, well, first Syria and then Alfie. And yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure I've got a lot of people that are not just plain not wanting to see what the hell I'm posting. In any case, not that it makes that much of a difference. I still have 406 stalkers. They have gone up, they've gone down, they've gone up, and they've gone down. But, um, oh, Baron Trump reportedly being bullied at school. Shock, shock. You know what? Kids will do that. That's what children do. Call out the little frickin' bullies. And if I had that song, I would have started out with it. But... Bully by Shine Down. Yeah. Stop putting up with the nonsense and stop allowing them to get away with it. You know what? There's more of you than there are of them. Actually, maybe I should say there's more of us than there are of them. So, yeah, you just need to find somebody to 
go with you or be with you, stand with you, even if you have to stand by yourself. Sometimes you got to do that to tell them, hey, up the old chocolate whiz way, buddy. Leave me the hell alone. Whoo, I need to finish saying hi. Over here on this effing site, I just got a new friend. Hi, Julian Schumann. Thank you for sending me a friend request. I truly do appreciate it. Um, <coughs> say what kind of, oh, you're just making lots of friends right now. Okay, cool beans. Thank you, Grimmy, for sharing me over here on the effing site. Grimmy always shares me all, he's sharing me all over the place. I ain't sharing, sharing, but he'll share me. <laughs> That's just kind of cold, Grim. I don't know that, what did everybody else do to deserve that? <laughs> oh, well, thank you, dear, for posting it over here on this effing site. By the way, May 23rd is the day. If you can donate before then to help with the server fees, it would be greatly appreciated. Okay, um, this is freedomsnetwork.com, by the way. I also see Katie Troxel in Cowboy Tech and Robert Smith 200. Hi, Robert Smith 200. Um, teens Chinese prom dress sparks firestorm. Ooh, okay. Prom dresses are sparking firestorms. Hmm. What, did it have lots of sparklies? Is that what the deal was? Okay, let's see. I've been to Fakie Book, been to Effin Site, been to Twitter, been to Minds. I think it's time for me to get over where you need to be if you want to give me static tonight. Cause, or any time, basically. Because um, I usually loiter around there in the RLM chat. Um, do -do -do -do. Making bread. Ooh, oh, white chocolate chip cookies, oh, yay. Hmm, okay, and Kate is making bread, and I watched a documentary yesterday about some of the things that we should not be eating if we truly wish to heal ourselves and keep our bodies healthy, and grains is one of those things. Yeah, it was... Um, the magic pill, which is kind of sort of why I went with my intro today. Uh, yeah, the uh, keto diet, is that what it is? Lots of protein, fruits, veggies, kick the grains, fats. Yes, you need fats as well. Kick the sugars. And um, yeah, I do eat that way for the most part, except for like pasta and bread. <laughs> In other words, no, I don't eat like that at all. But <laughs> go figure. Oh, well. Over here on the RLM, which is where you need to be if you want to give me some static. Right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. And closely followed by Cowboy Tech, who always hears pleasant voices. And don't get your hearing checked, hon. I really do appreciate you, um, yeah, saying it's pleasant. <laughs> Because I know there's a few times I have not been so pleasant. <laughs> but at least I admit it. Right? Okay, I also see Grimner, who is the RLM god, closely followed by the lovely Moose Girl. Hey, Moosey. Um. <laughs> yes, Kate. More bacon, less bread. Bacon! And steak, and roast, and chicken, and fish. And, you, you know, I really do eat a lot of that kind of stuff. It's just that I, I got to have my grains. I really do. I like my breads. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, Miss Kate is here, too, making bread and making me jealous. <laughs> now I'm going to have to make some bread tomorrow. I also see Asmo is here. Hey, Asmo, as well as Chalcedony. A double dip and a Chloe going on. Chloe reported about a um, plane crash. Early, was that earlier today? Air National Guard C-130 crashes in Georgia, killing at least five. That is not cool. Thanks for sharing that, Chloe. Thoughts and, and prayers going out to the families of those that have moved on to the next realm. You know what? And yeah, those that moved on to the next realm, they don't really need my thoughts and prayers and stuff. Although, hey, 
to you over there on the next realm, but the families need a little bit of help with dealing with they're no longer here in the physical. So, um, I, 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 I hear you, Kate. I'd much rather give up meat than grains and starches, too. But, <clears throat> I do get plenty of exercise, too, so, you know. And I could see doing that, you know, like for, for a, a week, you know, to have a week of reset. Um, but it really was that that documentary really is amazing. It's called The Magic Pill. I watched it on on Netflix last night and um, the progress. They had two kids that were autistic um, highlighted in it and the progress of both of those children by uh, um, getting rid of all of the processed foods and the starches and sugars. And yeah, you can have some starches and sugars, but predominantly it's um, it is meats and fats and fruits and veggies, but, um, yeah, the progress that they made was absolutely amazing, and then they also have a gal that, um, is diabetic, and, um, by the time, by the end of the documentary, and I, I can't remember, I think 10 weeks or something like that, that she had been on this diet, and she'd lost, I don't remember how much weight she said she'd lost, but she was no longer on insulin. She had corrected her diabetic issues. Also, there was another gal that is highlighted in there that had um, breast tumor. And um, it was malignant. And she refused surgery. She refused chemo. She refused radiation. And she just went on this keto diet. And um, she's cancer-free. The, the cancer cell just died and went away so you know it's amazing and people are starting to realize what you put into this operating system we call our meat suit that we motivate around in this world the fuel you feed it is how well it will perform and how well it will heal itself so go check that that documentary out uh, when you get a chance because it really is pretty fascinating okay back to saying hey free enslaved is here hi free how's things how's fang i also see ib don c is here hi don i really 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 would love a puppy but oh man i would be in so much trouble <laughs> with all my fur babies and probably with my kids and uh puppies oh well java 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 doctor two is in the house hey eh? java how's the lovely little lily i haven't heard any updates or seen any updates on her lately i also see jj's is in the house from over on webcom.co.uk. Hey, JJ's, how's your world shaking? And looky there, Juana Taco is here. Mmm, sounds yummy, but I got leftovers to clean up out of the fridge. And yeah, tuna salad, or I, I did smothered pork steaks last night with uh, long grain wild rice. And what else do I have? <laughs> I got all kinds of leftovers that, yeah, I need to start cleaning them out make room make room uh meister Brower. hey woody how you doing the lovely rain is here rain 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 we're supposed to get rain here yay that would be cool um rlm fluke the vanna white of the rlm channel as well as rob works did you fire up that bubbler hun do not starve people of their bubbler bubblers are necessary that is one of the major food groups at least according to me. Trust no one is here. Hey, you trusty feller. As well as a double dose of Woodman. So we got a trifecta of Woody. Just one of them's Meisterbrower. And then two Woodies. Beetle. Hi, Beetle. How are you, hon? And Colfax 101. That, shh, don't tell anyone. But that's Nenson Dubois' alter ego. He uses that one. And then when he steps into a phone booth, he becomes da 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 Nenson Dubois. See, I'm a poet. <laughs> I also see Dakotas in the house, as well as Dima and Echelon. Hello, Echelon. Flash Nasty is also logged in, as well as yours truly and Frumpy. 
Why am I not up there? Why am I down here? I don't know. Um, Ibi Doncy Woik is here, and Kozu, and another Meister Brower. Holy crap, the world's going to implode. We got so many woodies going on. Oh, man, that sounds like a personal problem. I also see Moy, 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 Moy as well. <laughs> we got a lot of pox going on. A pox upon thee. We got pox box. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds naughty. Poxified and poxophone and poxy home. Maybe that's a Dr. Seuss kind of thing. I also see pom -po pon sauces here, as well as the one, the only, the phantom to round out the crew. Now I need a quick sip of my coffee because I had to fix coffee when I got home. It's a wee bit chilly outside and... Uncle Tommy's garage is not heated, and so cleaning off shelves and cleaning out, oh my God, bless his heart. Do you know, Grandpa helped tear down a lot of buildings, and every nail that he saved, he straightened if it needed straightening. Oh my God. He had lots and lots and lots and, well, needless to say, I needed coffee to warm me up. So... Let's see. Speaking of coffee, for those of you that like to put something besides coffee in your coffee, which I tend to, especially after a couple of cups because the coffee starts making my tummy a little bit acidic, acidic. And so, from the modern hippie, um, a coconut oil coffee creamer, which I have put coconut oil in my coffee and it really is quite tasty. Um... But this is, okay, I'll just read this to you. First time I'd heard about adding oil and fat to coffee, I'm sure the look on my face was a mix between confusion and disgust, which that's kind of sort of what mine was too, first time. And then I tried it, and it was like, oh, this isn't bad. I mean, it's not every day that you come across a drink containing coconut oil and butter. Butter? Not margarine. Butter. Especially in a society where we're desperately trying to remove fat and calories from everything we consume because it's so bad, although fat got made into the boogeyman, when it's actually sugar. For me, this concept took some getting used to. Not long ago, I used to be one of those consumers. And I'd analyze calories without even glancing at the ingredients and buy non-fat French, French vanilla coffee creamer, oblivious to the fact that palm oil was the third ingredient. Because at the time, being skinny was a priority, and that meant ditching fatty and high-calorie foods, which nah, uh, fills the bubbler with... Jesus, bud. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Grimmy, for bubbling us. Jesus, bud. Is that kind of cheesy? Hmm. In any case, and yeah, I'm a French vanilla kind of gal, if I can get it. So, yeah, that's me too. In any case, <clears throat> I started reading labels. Hmm. <laughs> Now that I'm older and wiser and my priorities have shifted from must be skinny to must be healthy, I know that adding fat to your diet is not going to make you fat. Coconut oil in particular actually boosts your metabolism and helps burn calories. Coconut oil, unlike most oil, contains medium chain fatty acids instead of long chain fatty acids. Now, medium-chain fatty acids are metabolized differently than long-chain, which leads to a beneficial boost in the metabolism. And there is a study along these lines. Uh, one to two tablespoons of medium-chain fats, i.e. coconut oil, per day increased energy expenditure by 5%. This totals to 120 calories per day, which if I have 120 calories, then little bastards are in my closet at night and they're sewing my clothes tighter. And I swear to God, they are. They are little bastards. Regardless of the health benefits, I've been adding coconut oil to my coffee for a couple years now because it just tastes so good. It does, actually. So, 
doesn't make your coffee greasy or coconutty as one might think. Instead, this coconut oil coffee creamer will provide you with a rich and creamy coffee that is perfectly sweetened with honey and flavored with cinnamon and vanilla. No palm oil, no preservatives, no artificial sweeteners. Now if you pair this coffee with a nutritious breakfast, you set yourself up for a pretty great day. Now the reasons why she loves her coconut oil coffee creamer is um, unlike adding cold milk or cream, uh, coconut oil creamer doesn't cool down my hot cup of coffee, doesn't dilute the flavor, because she likes her coffee strong, which I'm not, I don't want it to be road tar. I want it to have a kick, but I don't want it to kick me into the next century. But milk and cream, especially non-dairy milk, can water it down. Also, coconut oil is always on hand, whereas dairy creamers expire, and you're sometimes stuck drinking black coffee, which just isn't my thing, which it isn't my thing either, for the most part. I mean, I can, but I would prefer to have some kind of creamer. I don't have to have the sweet, but I do need to have some kind of creamer just to keep my tummy from burning. So, also, I feel alert and energized for longer than I would with just coffee alone. So, it's not a bulletproof coffee, uh, which you may have read about too, but Bulletproof Coffee contains one to two tablespoons of grass-fed butter, one to two tablespoons of brain octane or XCT oil, and these are 18, 18 times and six times stronger than coconut oil with no flavor, oof, I, mm. and one and a half cups of coffee, all blended in a blender. That doesn't sound yummy at all. In any case, how do you make coconut oil coffee creamer? Well, and here are her ratios, what she prefers. The ingredients are 3 fourths cup coconut oil organic, soft but not melted, 1 half cup raw honey, 1 teaspoon of cinnamon, um, cinnamon powder, 1 teaspoon of pure vanilla extract, and as an option, 1 tablespoon of cocoa powder. You combine all the ingredients in a bowl and whisk, uh, stir or whisk together until they're well combined, and then you store them in a glass jar with a sealed lid. You can store it in the cupboard, and it doesn't need to be refrigerated as it won't spoil. So, for those of you that do like a little bit of creamer in your coffee, and it really, you know, it really doesn't give it that creamy, like milk creamy, it just makes it a little bit smoother, I think. You know, you can also put a pinch of, of baking soda in your grounds before you brew it, and that will take cut some of the acidic part, which I've been known to do that as well. But she also does this with uh, her magic bullet, which I just happen to have a magic bullet, but I wouldn't use it for this. I just, I just stir it in. My coffee's hot. I just stir it in. It does look yummy, though, and I'm going to have to try her recipe. But I will go ahead and share this with you. Ducks are migrating. Ducks. Duck, 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 duck. We are nipper sinkers. We're in luck. If it rains all week, we can quack like a duck. Hey, Vinny. <laughs> quack, quack, waddle, waddle, quack, quack, waddle, waddle. I'm going to put this over on the effing site. Yeah, it's a wackadoodle Wednesday. Okay. Yum, yum, yum. Now see, for me, a healthy breakfast would be probably, I have some potato bread that is really yummy, and toast it and put um, a little bit of butter on it, a little bit of jalapeno jelly on it, and then a cup of this kind of coffee, and oh my God, I would be sitting in tall cotton. Of course, you know, a couple of eggs would be good too, but I don't necessarily do eggs every morning. I should, but I don't. And yes, I either fry them in butter or bacon grease or coconut oil. So I don't I don't use any other weird oils anymore. You know, the only oils I use are coconut oil, butter, and virgin olive oil. And no, it's not the virgin that you throw in a volcano. 
bet. Okay. Got that shared. Yes. Vinny! Is that you, Vinny? Is that you, Vinny? How's Texas? How's Texas, hon? Did you have fun at your wedding reception thingy? That was a, that was this last weekend, wasn't it? Oh, well. Also, you know what re is really cool about coconut oil? Coconut oil is, is very beneficial for your body. And... And you can kind of do a swishy with your coffee, and it's almost like it'll it'll ease you into uh, pulling with coconut oil, which is very good for your dentition, the teeth and the tissue, dentition. So yeah, I used to work at a dentist office. Can you tell? I know a lot of them their terms. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Where do I want to go? Let's go to the pocket, shall we? Um, <laughs> uh, which ones do I want to go to? Uh, international. Doo -doo. Okay, here we go. Turmeric, which I'm going to have to get me some more turmeric because mine did not. Mm, I don't know what I did different, unless maybe the air was just too moist or what. But the ginger's doing great, but my turmeric, no. Turmeric, however you want to pronounce it. Both pronunciations are apparently acceptable. Um, but this is from NewsTarget.com. Over 7,000 studies confirm that uh, turmeric's health and protective effects. This is from January of last year. Turmeric is known for its rich yellow color and its myriad of culinary uses. The Old World spice has been coveted for centuries with evidence indicating that it may have even been part of an ancient Chinese medicine a thousand years ago. Ancient Chinese secret! Who remembers those commercials? Sports fans. <laughs> oh... Oh, Vinny, I cry every time at the mom and son dance and the, the daughter and dad dance. I, I'm a big old sap when it comes to that. Just got to say. Okay, back to this article. Um, recently, however, this traditional culinary staple is gaining recognition for its amazing health benefits. Some 7,000 studies have been conducted, and much of the research shows that turmeric is a powerful healing agent with a wide variety of applications. It's antibacterial, anti-mutagenic, anti-fungal, anti-inflammatory, and antiviral properties are just some of the things that make turmeric so special. Now, I got to stop right here and tell you, I'm quite impressed with myself that I made it through all of those antis without a single stutter. Okay, moving along. It's also loaded with micronutrients like vitamin C, E, and K, and minerals such as calcium, zinc, iron, and magnesium. The research demonstrates the power of turmeric. Because several studies have shown that turmeric even has the ability to f uh, help fight against certain types of cancer. Yes... Um, actually, Grim, I think I, mm, I did not get the Star West Botanicals. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should go there. But, you know, the, I got the, my ginger came from the same place. And the ginger is doing fine. It's, it's sending up shoots and all that fun stuff. So, yay. But the turmeric just didn't do well. Ay, 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 ay. Oh, needs black pepper to get the... Oh, oh. And yes, black pepper is good for you too. I have black pepper oil. Okay, moving along. Yeah, I, I'm, an, I'm an oily bugger. <laughs> okay, I do like my essential oils. But, back to this. Um, okay, fight against certain types of cancer. So, for example, in 2015... 
Um, a review published by the journal Molecules states that curcumin, which is a key component in uh, turmeric, can inhibit the initiation, progression, and mass, um, metastasis of a number of different kinds of tumors. So, the review authors also note that curcumin halts disease progression by inducing um, apoptosis or cell death. Apoptosis? Is that how you say that? Whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. The team notes that the time their review was completed, some 6,850 studies of turmeric had been published. That's just the ones published. There's an awful lot of stuff that doesn't go public, doesn't get published. So, you know, if you don't have funding, a lot of times people don't research. That's part of the problem. Um, and this also, they are also noting that many of these are indicative of the spice's potential health benefits. So in their conclusion, the author writes, a plethora of in vitro and in vivo research together with clinical trials conducted over the past few decades substantiate the potential of curcumin as an anti-cancer agent. The team notes that curcumin is limited by its bioavailability, bio but states that regardless of potential drawbacks, curcumin is a safe and promising molecule for the prevention and therapy of not only cancer, but also other inflammation-driven diseases such as arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, fibromyalgia, lots of different, I'm, I'm sure that's probably later in this article, but those are some that just came to mind. Um, another recent study, also published in 2015, was indicative of, of curcumin's anti-cancer effects. The study was conducted by a team of researchers from Emory University's Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology and was published by the journal PLOS1. The team sought to investigate how curcumin exacts its apoptosis inducing effects in cancer cells or in cancer cell lines of the upper areodigestive tract which refers to the lungs, the bronchus, the larynx, the, the, the pharynx, and the oral cavity. After treating cancerous tissue samples with curcumin, the team examined the effects. From their findings, the team surmised that curcumin's um, apoptosis inducing effects were prompted by the ability to simultaneously turn on a tumor suppressor gene and downregulate anti apoptosis proteins. Yeah, I understood that. <laughs> Basically what it did was it kind of sort of starved the tumor cells. Oh, hey, essentially this means that their data indicated that curcumin turns on cancer suppression and turns off the production of proteins that prevent cell death. So together these effects result in the cancer cell dying and being resorbed into the body and then flushed away. Some of the other benefits are, you know, other than fighting cancer, um, let's see... For example, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study found that turmeric supplements could help support a more balanced mood. The study, published in the Journal of Affective Disorders, found that just eight weeks of turmeric supplementation boosted pay, uh, participant scores on depression and anxiety tests. All of the participants in the group exhibited substantial improvement compared to the placebo group. Studies have also indicated that turmeric can help to relieve physical discomfort, too. A four-week study published in the Journal of Clinical Interventions in Aging found that turmeric worked as well as ibuprofen at relieving osteoarthritis pain. Actually, it works better because it's not as damaging to the liver and a few other major organs as ibuprofen is. Um, and that it works better than the pharmaceutical when it came to relieving joint stiffness. So, a previous study published in 2011 also found that turmeric helped to relieve pain. 
and the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study published in Surgical Endo, uh, Endosco in, yeah, Endoscopy. Endoscopy. <laughs> I knew I was going to be stuttering over some of this shit. Damn it! They found that turmeric supplements relieved post-operative discomfort in gallbladder surgery patients better than placebo. And in three-week intervals, patients taking the supplement reported significantly less pain and discomfort than the placebo patients. Now, turmeric also has other health benefits. It has been used to promote wound healing, soothe tissue irritation, relieve stomach aches, and boost heart health. It's a truly miraculous substance that continues to astound researchers across the globe. So, and it's tasty too. So, you guys talking about Gilligan's Island? Marianne was way cooler than Ginger. Way cooler. Ginger was very, very... um um, high maintenance. Yeah, that's a way to put it. Um, Lord. Um, yes, Vinny, it does work for rheumatoid arthritis as well. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to get to, because my mother, bless her heart, she will be 87 soon, and uh, she was having some memory issues, and she allowed some family members to poke and prod her into um, getting some more tests done. And so she had an MRI done on Monday, and she got the results back, and they said that she has um, vascular dementia, early signs of vascular dementia which my siblings all went egad and they're wanting to know timeline of when she's going to have to have someone live with her or she's going to have to live with someone else or this or that or the other thing and i'm like come on peeps take a chill pill it's cool it's cool this is fixable this is fixable and um i instantly started pulling up some of my um my links to kind of let everybody know that hey hey it's not that bad now uh, one of the things that I did share was um, a Dr. Bergman video on how to reverse dementia and I also went to naturalnews.com and uh, this is an old article, but it's still relevant because it still wakes. Dementia is reversible with natural methods. Now, um, and the link is from News Target. Natural methods can be used to avoid and improve dementia system symptoms. Um, in part one, they examined how diet plays a key role in improving the symptoms of dementia. But diet is only the first step in avoiding or treating dementia. Now, one of the things that they say is to remove your gas appliances. Um, I'm not real sure what the deal is with that, but um, apparently it's the whole fossil fuel thing, you know, with your natural gas for your heating and for cooking. So... Switching to electric heat cooking with an electric stove and using electric water heater can lead to improvement in dementia sy symptoms. But you also need to deal with removing some of the toxicity that's causing this. And some of hers, and I have told my siblings, she needs to get off her high blood pressure meds. Her, high, her blood pressure is not that high, and those meds are helping this issue that she's experiencing right now. Helping not in a good way, by the way. Also, supplements that you should use for if you are having any kind of issues with dementia is lecithin. 
it feeds the brain and cleans the arteries and veins. Um, DMAE is an acet acetyl L carnitine, and it will increase the levels of neurotransmitter acetylcholine and CoQ10, or bilberry, ginkgo biloba, grape seed, coenzyme CoQ10. Um, they all help improve circulation. So, studies have also shown that turmeric, ta 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 ta, milk thistle, olive leaf, ho um, holy basil, olive oil are all beneficial for dementia patients as well. So, when I go to visit my mom, I'm taking her some turmeric. And I'm also taking, going to get her some virgin olive oil because she does um, apple cider vinegar and oil for her dressing on her salad anyway. And she eats lots of fruits and veggies anyway. But I'm going to take that down to her and tell her, okay, this is for your salads, Mom. This will help. Also, other things that you should do if you or a loved one have been diagnosed with this. Throw out all of your aluminum cookware and even the tea ball. If you have a little, you know those little things that you put your tea in to steep, get rid of it. Give up using foils and even supplements covered with foil tops. Look for baking powders without aluminum. Switch to plastic or glass salt shakers and buy salt without aluminum. Also, Tape over all handles in the bathroom and other places with masking tape. So, I don't know that you would need to go that far, but it also goes on to say deworming is one of the crucial items to be worked on to be getting rid of body flukes is imperative. So, I did not know that body flukes were an issue, but apparently so. Juicing an entire pumpkin also. Um, take a regular pumpkin and juice the entire pumpkin, skin, seed, and all, and drink the juice within six hours in three divided doses. Wow, that's an awful lot of pumpkin juice. Hmm. Um, da -da. And here's some steps that you can take for immediate relief of brain fog. Before sleeping, take one fourth cup of extra virgin olive oil mixed with the juice of one lemon. Before breakfast, take one teaspoon of nigella sativa oil mixed with one teaspoon of raw honey. Also, one, um, one half hour later, take one tablespoon of Father Romano's Zago recipe, which is one half liter of honey one ounce of distillates, which is like raw apple cider vinegar, um, and 350 grams of whole aloe vera leaves juiced and mix well. Ooh, I have some aloe juice too. I may take that down to her as well. Um, let's see. A brain elixir that you can use for a mid-afternoon snack is to place one cup of yogurt, two figs, one rosemary twig, and one tablespoon of olive oil in a jar. Refrigerate overnight and the next afternoon place it in a blender and mix it well. So, there are lots of things that people can do. Um, and one of the key things as well is to get plenty of sunshine, which my mom does, eat no packaged or processed foods, and avoid all pharmaceutical medications. All of them. So, which is, that's going to be a battle. It's not going to be hard for me to convince my mom. Yes, I did, Kate, sativa oil. Um, mom hates taking her blood pressure meds. Um, and Grimmy, if, um, how would you know if you had dementia? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. You know, they say the memory is the first thing to go, but <laughs> never know. 
Okay, I'm going to share this over here on the FN site, and then I need to quick grab that turmeric as well and get it over here. Um, I'm slackering. Okay. Also, check out Dr. John Bergman on YouTube. He has lots and lots and lots of absolutely awesome videos that teach you the nutrition behind the benefit or the benefit behind the nutrition, however you wish to put that. And he also explains to you exactly what side effects are to like statin drugs, high blood pressure drugs, um, diabetic treatments, all that fun stuff. All of those things are reversible if you know how, but you really do need to get you a nutritionist or a holistic doctor or somebody to help you wean yourself off of whatever, because don't just quit taking the meds. You need to wean yourself off. So, now that I've had those, back to my pocket I go. Um... Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, this one is from Dr. Mercola. And it's from April 29th of this year. This also affects your health, but it's not, you know, it's, it's a eyes open peeps kind of thing. Research explains how electromagnetic fields damage your health. So, electromagnetic fields, or EMFs, have been shown to cause biological damage and even cancer. But exactly how does this happen? In an interview, Dr. Paul um, Harrow, PhD, a researcher and professor of toxicology and health effects of electromagnetic Magnetic. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to have one of those nights, aren't I? Magnetism at the Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal helps to answer the question. Originally trained as a physicist, he eventually ended up studying electrical power transmission lines. The topic of his PhD, and in the course of working for a power utility, he started investigating the health effects associated with fields emitted from power lines. And I can tell you, there's a big ass power line thing just about six miles east of me that whenever I go into town, I have to drive under that damn thing. And I get within a mile of it, and I start hearing the hum in my ears and it's not until I get into town that that hum goes away so I don't know if I just have special hearing uh, many would tell me that I have selective hearing <laughs> but yeah I know I can hear that shit when I get close to them so ugh. and I get it gives me kind of a wonky feeling but don't ask me to explain wonky it's just when you have it you'll know it in any case <clears throat> it goes on to say, I've got in, I got involved in biology, followed courses in medicine, and became, so to speak, a different person from what my supervisors initially would have expected me to be, he says. In time, he became a specialist on the effects of magnetic fields on the human body and joined the faculty of medicine to help protect health and the environment. Now, as for the types of EMFs, broadly speaking, EMFs include electron or electric, magnetic, and radio frequency fields. So while the literature tends to discriminate between low frequency fields, high frequency fields, microwaves, electric fields, and magnetic fields, all of these have certain commonalities that allow you to lump them together, at least in terms of their biological action. It's true that frequency influences the effects. But basically, I could use an electric field or a magnetic field and produce the same effect in a cell. 
most higher frequency signals have enough low frequency components to have a lot in common with the low frequency components. Okay. In practical aspect, or the practical aspect of this, is that usually the fields have an effect maybe in one application, but they are mirrored in other applications as well. And there's a type of great unifying view that you can have about these fields. It's also important to realize the damage EMFs cause has nothing to do with thermal effects. At typical exposures, EMFs do not create heat, which has been the telecommunication industry's main defense and argument for the safety of cell phone radiation. However, hundreds of researchers have in fact noted biological effect both at low and high frequencies. Covering the whole spectrum, there is no doubt that there are biological effects, says Hero. And there's no doubt that there's substantial health effects when we, when we have been ex, um, experiencing it, or, okay, when we have been experiencing for a long time, and that have been increasing our health bills. Initially, I got into the field because a power utility asked me to design an instrument that would measure electromagnetic fields on the workers. I designed a dios, uh, dosimeter, that's what it is. I designed a dosimeter that was very successful unit. After that, I imagine maybe this would be followed up with basic work on biology of the phenomenon. But obviously, the utility was not interested in that. Essentially, about that time, I went to McGill University and started to do research. I had a student in the lab who was working on toxicity of metals, who came to me one day and said, why don't you give me a subject that would be more spectacular than the toxicity of metals? And this student started to work on magnetic fields. The results that came out of these experiments were quite spectacular. The effects were very, very strong. From then on, I felt I could not ignore this and that I had to bring this to the attention of the world. So what they discovered is that even small levels of magnetic fields, such as 60 hertz, can have drastic effects on cancer cells and culture. Research published as early as 1985 showed quite clearly that these fields also are able to suppress metabolism. Some 15 years later, Hero duplicated those results and was able to determine the mechanism behind it. In his research, he and his study did on cancer cells, using a field of 60 hertz, effects began around 20 nanotesla, which is about 0 0.02 microtesla, or 0.2 milligauss, and were fully developed around 50 nanotesla, um, at levels over 160 NT, or nanotesla, magnetic fields have also been shown to affect sperm production, and male fertility declined by about 50% between 1973 and 2013. Research, um, recent research also reveals prenatal exposure to powerful frequency fields can nearly triple a pregnant woman's risk of miscarriage. These are environmental fields that most people spend a majority of their time in. Based on my own measurements, a vast majority of people never actually leave these fields. They remain in them continuously. Simply living in a home wired for electricity makes it difficult to avoid these fields unless you take remedial action such as turning off your circuit breaker at night, which, mm, Wow. It may come to that, but wow. Our environment is essentially filled with these disturbances to our metabolism. From the point of view of industry, this is wonderful because this contamination being evenly spread and present everywhere becomes the new normal. 
In other words, if you don't want to be caught poisoning the population, expose them all at the same time so that there's no reference population. Yeah, dirty buggers. Sam Milham, who I recently interviewed on the topic of dirty electricity, did some amazing investigation, um, investigative epi epidemiological work. Wow, I'm stutter stumbling. And it showed radical differences in disease prevalence between rural and urban populations between 1900 and 1950. Once that rural population became electrified, their disease rates converged with the urban ones to a point that they are now near identical. I strongly believe that to be one of the most important observations of this century, said Harrow. So, the mechanism of action proposed by Harrow involves the enzyme ATP, um, which passes currents of photons through a water channel, similar to a current through, uh, passing through a wire. The protons have to go through about 20 molecules of water to get through this channel. ATP um, synthesis is extremely ancient and common to all living systems. It basically generates energy in the form of ATP from ADP using this flow of protons. Now magnetic fields can change the tran uh, transparency of the water channel to protons, thereby reducing the current. So as a result, you get less ATP, which can have system-wide consequences from promoting chronic disease and infertility to lowering intelligence. So when you impair the flow of protons to ATP synthesis, you increase mitochondrial membrane polarization. And if you increase the polarization of the mitochondria by 14%, you will have a 70%, 70% increase in the reactive oxygen species coming out of complex one, which is the leading edge of oxidative phosphor phosphorylation. Wow, I have no idea what you guys are talking about here. None whatsoever. <laughs> I hope somebody else does. Wow. Apparently, EMFs trigger massive oxidative stress. So, um, and they do this in the outer membrane of the cell, and it's consistent with increased oxidative stress and decreased ATP. Um, and Martin Paul believes that when activated by EMFs, these um, voltage-gated calcium channels open up, allowing for a massive influx of calcium, which is not necessarily a good thing. And this excess intracellular calcium and associated calcium signaling are responsible for most of the biological effects that we see. So, this is... Dr. Mercola, honey, you're really, really making my brain strain. Apparently, our species can evolve and is successful in a great part, and we are successful in generating large amounts of ATP. So, if you touch that, you're going to have disturbances in metabolism that will occur over a chronic exposure, which will result in increased rates of diabetes. Huh, and we're having increased rates of diabetes. Although, I have seen, you know, someone say, especially, on, it's amazing what people share on Facebook, of course, what I share on the radio. Um, but people have said, I just got diagnosed with um, stage zero diabetes. Are you fucking kidding me? Stage zero diabetes does not mean you have diabetes. That just means they're trying to give you a goddamn pill. Okay? Stage zero is... is uh, Anytime someone tells you you have stage zero of something... Tell them, thank you, no, I don't want any pills, and I will not be back. Hey. 
To go on with this, you can kill cancer cells with magnetic fields. Um, so while Harrow's research has revolved around validating the mechanisms of action, he's also currently trying to design a technique using low-frequency magnetic fields to kill cancer cells. Yes? Oh, later, Vinny. You have a wonderful evening, hun. Yeah, Ponder Gander, that's right. Yeah, be sure to check out at noon. Is it noon Central Time, Vinny? 1 o'clock Eastern Time? Vinny will be on with Ponder Gander on Friday. So, yeah, come back to the RLM and check Vinny out. Well, you can check him out anyway because Vinny's kind of shameless. But... <laughs> Thanks, Vinny. You have an awesome evening, hon. Um, so, back to this. So, if you can do this in vitro in a powerful way, then this should be able to be transferable fairly easily in animals. And in the past, we were able to kill cancer cells within one day or two simply by con selecting the correct magnetic field. And that was a lot of things that due to national security, a.k.a. the money that was coming in under the table from Big Pharma and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and all of those dirty bastards um, to different government agencies. There were all kinds of lovely little treatments and cures to cancer that had nothing to do with chemotherapy back in the day. Like a century ago, they had such things. But it all got poo-pooed and locked up. Patents got stolen. All kinds of fun stuff. Because of, well, national security and for your own good, dear. Yeah. 1 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Chloe. So that's noon my time. Have fun with the family, Vinny. Okay, back to this. I'm I'm going to push my way through this. So, um, let's see. Hero believes that uh, this strategy should work on most cancer cells, but he's only tested the ability to suppress metabolism in two different types of cancer cells so far. Cancer cells have the peculiar characteristic that they have crests of very high demand for ATP, meaning at a certain point in their development, they require very high amounts of energy to keep thriving. So if you starve them of sugar, that's right, Vinny, I did. That's because you are. <laughs> Picking on you, hon, because you're so pickable. Okay, back to this. So, by suppressing ATP synthesis, which produces 80 to 90% of the ATP in a cell, the cancer cell is not going to be able to survive. And as mentioned, suppressing ATP synthesis is what magnetic fields do. So if you add a little um, glycolic suppression in there, this cancer cell will have practically nowhere to go. If this turns out to be a viable strategy, it would be a far safer alternative to ionizing radiation or radiotherapy currently used. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just share this in the chat because, wow. <laughs> See you, Vinny. There's an awful lot of technical stuff there that y'all can read through. It's making my brain hurt. <laughs> Sometimes I can do the technical really good, but apparently on this Wackadoodle Wednesday, I'm having a little bit of trouble. So, that's some heavy reading there. Okay. Back to... I am going to... Do a search in my pocket for things on health. Because I've been just throwing stuff in my pocket willy-nilly the last few days. So, um, Here we go. I don't think I've done this one yet. 
which I need to send this article to my niece who was diagnosed with Lyme's disease. Um, this is from healthspiritbody.com. Stevia kills Lyme disease pathogen better than antibiotics. Booyah! With summer upon us, the risk of encountering ticks and the pesky critters responsible for the spread of Lyme disease is on the rise. Lyme disease is an insidious and complicated disease to treat both with the allopathic world and with the alternative medical practitioners due to the rapid, sha rapid shape shifting abilities. Now according to the CDC or as Dr. Bergman likes to call them the Center for Disease Propagation <clears throat> Roughly 300,000 people have been diagnosed with Lyme disease each year in the United States alone. So while ticks exist in half of all U.S. counties, Lyme disease cases are concentrated in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, with 14 states accounting for over 96% of cases reported to the Centers of Pro uh, Disease Propagation, Promotion, whatever. They do own patents, you know that, don't you? They are also a private entity, you know that too, don't you? Of course, you could say they're a governmental a entity, but ah, the government's a corporation anyway, so basically, saying the same thing. Now, the CDC says that while 80 to 90 percent of reported cases are considered resolved with the treatment of antibiotics, 10 to 20 percent of patients go on to develop the chronic form, which is a persistent and sometimes devastating illness that can harm any organ in the body, including the brain and the nervous system. Now, the culprit behind Lyme disease is Borrelia by Burgdorferi. Burgdorferi, that's a weird one. It's a bacterial infection proven to respond most effectively to antibiotics, but, yeah, doxycycline and amoxicillin. However, it can exist in a morphological forms, including, um, wow, those are some ones that I'm going to have fun not saying. <laughs> Let's just say it can morph. So, when conditions are considered unfavorable for the bacteria, it has the ability to morph into a dormant round body, then hide in a biofilm form. And when conditions are favorable, it can shift back to its original form. So, while conventional antibiotics can treat some forms of the disease, they're not effective in treating all forms, oftentimes failing to produce a long-term cure. Huh, shock, shock. It is bar big pharma, and if you don't have repeat customers, it's not a very smart business model, is it? Sadly, we are the repeat customers that they're practicing on. So, apparently there is new research that suggests a long-term treatment may be just around the corner. A recent study published in the European Journal of Microbiology and Immunology revealed that stevia, a sweetener, and sugar substitute has been found to terminate late state or chronic Lyme disease. The study conducted by researchers from the Department of Biology and Environmental Science at the University of New Haven in West Haven, Connecticut found that stevia whole leaf extract as an individual agent was an effective treatment against all known morphological forms. Hmm. And for the study, researchers examined the micro, um, antimicrobial effects of four stevia leaf extracts in comparison to individual antibiotics, as well as a combination of the three. And lab tests revealed that while one extract was more potent than the others, likely due to its growing conditions and the agricultural practices utilized, all extracts were effective in treating all forms of the bacteria. Booyah! 
In fact, the stevia extract was proven to work against even the most antibiotic resistant of the bacteria, known as the biofilm. The individual antibiotics, on the other hand, actually increased the biofilm. So, while researchers acknowledge that the results need more investigation and clinical trials to corroborate the findings, they're hoping that these results indicate we're one step closer to finding an effective treatment for even the most persistent forms of Lyme disease. So, there you go. Stevia. It's not just good for cooking with and sweetening things. Yeah, Java, Mercola does have an awful lot of very good info. My problem is that article is, wow. I like Dr. Mercola. I really do. That's where I learned about earthing, which maybe I need to go to Mercola and look up earthing. That would be cool, because I don't know how many people actually know what that is. I've been, you know, the weather's been nicer in the mornings. It's been in the upper 40s, lower 50s, which means it's kosher for me to go out barefoot and trundle around with the puppies. And now that the grass is coming up, it's nice and mushy. And oh, hey. I mean, I even have dandelions and that kind of stuff, but they're still nice and mushy. You know, it's not like pokey, not stickers. So, cool, cool, cool. Okay. I'm going to do this one. I will just look on Dr. Mercola. And, um, dun, dun, dun. Let's see. Oh, there's the original one where he, okay. Um, oh, is this a video or is it? It's probably a video. Legal updates on CBD and homeopath or homeopathy, however you wish to put that. Hmm, this is also from Mercola. Todd Harrison is a partner in the legal firm Venable LLP. It's one of the white hat legal firms that helps defend us and many other companies against the overreaches by federal regulatory agencies such as the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, Federal Trade Commission, FTC. And in this interview, he discusses the latest legal developments involving cannabinoid or CBD and homeopathy both of which have come under serious attack, including a lot of doctors who are passing on from this realm under somewhat suspicious circumstances. Harris's expertise is food and drug law and advertising law, and many of his clients are companies that market nutritional supplements and cosmetics. Venable also has a number of lawyers who used to work for federal regulatory agencies and have had an inside view of their workings. So, the legal update on CBD oil or cannabinoidal, um, it's the, it's the non-psychoactive component of cannabis and unlike THC, it does not induce a high but it has many clinical benefits, including the control of seizures and pain. With projections suggesting somewhere between 50,000 and 60,000 Americans will die from opioid overdose this year, we really are in dire need of non-toxic pain relief. So CBD oil and turmeric <laughs> are just two, just two. Apparently, CBD oil is one of them, but unfortunately, cannabis is classified a class 1 narcotic, which makes the legality surrounding CBD a bit more complex. Now, Harrison explains that what people should realize is that cannabis and hemp are the same plant, which that's also what Dr. Pappas has said. They're just 
Uh, one is indica, one is sativa. Is basically the difference, um, according to Dr. Pappas. Under federal law, it's a controlled substance. It cannot be marketed. It cannot be sold. That's regardless of what states have done. The federal government could clamp down on the states that have legalized cannabis and take action against individuals in those states, according to the federal government. But if you look at the or original way things were supposed to be, what we were taught, what we were told, which is probably a great big fat lie, although each great big fat lie always has a kernel of truth, home rule is key. Local, and then it spreads out. So, in states where they've legalized cannabis, it really depends upon the goodwill of the federal government not to enforce the U.S. drug laws. Although they are really are not drug laws, they're regulations, and there is a difference. There is a difference between a law and a regulation. Now, CBD is a different issue. It's kind of a complex issue because CBD is part of the hemp plant. It could also be part of the marijuana plant. It generally comes from the resin of the plant. CBD is considered by the Drug Enforcement Administration to be a controlled substance. It's considered to be marijuana. Considered. There is a case now pending before the Ninth Circuit of, Appe Ninth Circuit of Appeals. Oral hearings were on whether DEA's scheduling of CBD is appropriate. And we will have a decision in the Ninth Circuit from the DEA perspective probably sometime midsummer, but I would think no later than September. So, I truly believe that the Ninth Circuit will rule against the DEA, and I think the DEA um, has overstepped with non-psychoactive. You can't sit there and classify everything under marijuana to be a controlled substance. I think, in the end, it's a fight that DEA is losing. The lawsuit was brought by several hemp growers against the DEA, and it's been going on for a while. And we're at the Court of Appeals stage, and we expect a decision. I think the arguments are very strong that the DEA has overstepped its bounds. From a controlled substance point of view, that decision of the Ninth Circuit will either be a game changer or it will be the industry's worst nightmare. So, now the drug industry may ultimately push for descheduling of CBD. Why? Because they're probably going to try and come up with a synthetic version of it. So, considering that CBD is non-psychoactive, there's really nothing the DEA to, for the DEA to be concerned about. You can't get high from it, and it's not addictive. From these facts alone, it makes absolutely no sense to regulate CBD as a class 1 narcotic. One possible ulterior motive might involve collusion with the drug industry. Might, maybe, almost, kind of, sort of, possibly. So by eliminating CBD, drug Drug companies stand to make more money from drug sales. However, the drug industry may ultimately want CBD to be descheduled as well, as companies have started developing CBD-based drugs. They're not going to want it to be a controlled substance. In the end, I think that even the Ninth Circuit case, if it goes badly, my prediction would be that once the FDA approves, GW Pharmaceuticals new drug, there's going to be a recommendation to deschedule CBD from the FDA. Unfortunately, even if the FDA calls for the descheduling of CBD to pave the way for CBD drugs, it won't help manufacturers of CBD supplements. GW Pharmaceuticals have already been granted a patent for the CBD product and are pursuing classification as a drug. Once that drug application goes through, it becomes a crime to sell CBD oil unless you've gone through the FDA drug approval process. It's not a drug. It's a natural supplement, but... Mm. In 2006, GW Pharma filed an investigation new drug application with the FDA 
to conduct clinical trials on CBD because it held a lot of promise for patients with certain seizure disorders. To be able to make that type of claim, you'd have no choice but go through clinical trials. And then they instituted clinical trials immediately after that. Those dates are important because under Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, if an ingredient is a subject of an IND and significant clinical trials prior to its use as a dietary ingredient, you'd have to get authorization from the FDA to market the ingredient. Nobody paid attention to this. The CBD industry just went hog wild and decided that they were going to get it into the market and ignored that part of the law. There's still actually a limited time for action. Somebody could petition the FDA to market CBD as a dietary ingredient. Now the only way it ever becomes a preclusion is if somebody does an act prior to FDA approving CBD as a new drug. Once they approve it as a new drug, it would be precluded unless FDA actually went ahead and permitted its use before that. That's the rub here. It's that there's a small window of time that a company could go forward with FDA. There's a good chance that the FDA may reject it. You may very well have a very good case to bring it to a court because there's no reason that CBD shouldn't be able to be marketed as a dietary ingredient. But nobody is doing that right now. And because of that, the industry risks um, that with the FDA. Once it approves that CBD is a drug, there's no way of being able to use CBD as a single um, mark or single monitor marketed supplement, CBD companies in many ways act like the cannabis crowd saying if everybody is selling it then we've, we're not going to have any problems. We're going to force the law to change that way. You're not going to force it to change from the inside. You're just not. But they may very well, and this is my speculation, tell the FDA you need to do something at that point or they may try to do it themselves by bringing their own actions and that risk the CBD industry takes. So, I once argued, are you better off having the fight now or later? If the fight's going to happen, should you just go ahead and do it now or should you go ahead and do it later? From that perspective, maybe it's better to have the fight now. While it's not an approved drug, because having the fight after it's an approved drug is going to make it significantly more difficult. So yeah, anybody in the CBD market, you need to start this process, peeps, because it is a supplement. Now, considering the risks of not petitioning the FDA to have CBD approved as a dietary supplement, why hasn't anyone done it already? Barring poor legal advice, the most likely reason is the cost. To file a good petition with the FDA, with all the safety data and everything that you would need, you're probably talking about fifty to eighty thousand dollars. But if you lose to the FDA, the litigation cost could easily reach the mid six figures to low seven figures. And that's probably why people don't do this. Maybe it needs to be a class action thing. I don't know. So, CBD can come from either cannabis or hemp. Again, the distinction between these two plants hints, hinges on the THC content. Hemp has very little, if any, THC, whereas cannabis will have, very, or have varying amounts of THC depending on the species. Hemp products such as hemp oil and hemp extract are legal. So even though they may have small amounts of CBD, hemp products can be lawfully marketed. That's the potential loophole for the CBD industry. The drawback is that hemp products may not have much CBD in them and they may not be clinically effective. 
So there are many instances where people have simp moved simply to avail themselves of legal medical cannabis, and it's truly sad that it's not available across the nation. But CBD products are currently available in all states, and that could change soon, depending on how this pending litigation plays out. Now, as for the homeopathics, um, the FDA has issued a draft document in which they state that they intend to exercise enforcement discretion on homeopathic products, but made it clear that they believe homeopathic medicines are unapproved new drugs. Now, Harrison says that I believe they're just wrong on the law. Homeopathy goes back a long time. It goes back to the original food uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It is recognized as a drug in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Why are we vilifying a whole medicinal paradigm just because it doesn't fit our Western medicine? Indeed, the FDA's stance comes across as both irrational and inconsistent. On one hand, they're saying that there's no way homeopathy can work since there's no active ingredient. It's just a vibrational essence or energy of an active ingredient left due to extreme dilution. On the other hand, they want to treat homeopathics as new drugs. The legality that allows for this inconsistency is the fact that it's the disease claim that makes the product a drug. In other words, if the product claims to treat a disease, it's a drug. If it makes no claims to treat a disease, it's not a drug. Which is why we are told with our oils that they may help with, but they do not treat, they do not cure. But I'd, I think that's just bullshit. There are things out there in nature. It is not a drug if it cures. Dumbasses. That's just your monetary mindset. So, this is another long one that I'm just going to go ahead and share and let you guys finish reading it. Because I do need to. Vinny quit. Vinny quit. Um, what's this? Okay, put this over in the effing site as well. Whoa. I just shifted. Okay. I think I need to go to the pig. See what happened this date in history. Okay, we'll read some more good news here. Um, oh. Okay, go and check out the pig. Real quick. Excuse me. Come on, boys. Hambo and Porcus, what are you two up to today? Word of the day is teacher's union. That's actually a phrase, but that's okay. It's a subversive cabal that is systematically indoctrinating America's young'uns with Marxist claptrap. Yeah. It's not intended to teach you anything other than how to regurgitate. In the quotable quotes section, Attention government cess school inmates. We're sorry your mandatory government cess school incarceration doesn't include meaningful training in such mundane topics as reading, writing, and arithmetic. So today we're going to teach you to say white male oppression with genuine heartfelt emotion. That is from those fun little boys over here on the free state of pig. So which reminds me of another one. 
Um, smart ass children. Teacher asks a child, why are you late? And the child responds by saying, well, class started before I got here. <laughs> oh, kids. Kids, kids, kids. This date in history, the 2nd of May, 1972, world-famous political blackmailer and infamous transvestite J. Edgar Organized Crime Doesn't Exist Hoover kicks the bucket at age 77. See ya. Sayonara. And this date in history, the 2nd of May, 1997, thespian Eddie Beverly Hills Cop Murphy makes a bold career move, increases his name recognition when cops catch him with a transsexual hooker. Ooh, very interesting. Thanks, boys, for that one. Hmm... Okay, that's pretty much all the Hambo and Porkus have for today. Gosh darn it, you guys are slackers. Okay, I think Grimmy shared this over in the RLM a little bit ago. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe, who was, oh no, I saw this over on the effing site. That's where I saw it. That's where I got it. It's from cnsnews.com. Speaking of cesspools of educraption. 65% huh. of public school 8th graders not proficient in reading and 67% not proficient in math. Yoinks. <clears throat> so, 65% of the 8th graders in American public schools in 2017 were not proficient in reading and 67 were not proficient in mathematics. That's according to the National Assessment of Education Progress test results released by the U.S. Department of Educraption. You guys control and micromanage everything, and this is the result you get. The results are far worse for students enrolled in some urban districts. Among the 27 large urban districts for which the Department of Educraption published 2017 NAEP test scores, the Detroit public schools had the lowest percentage of students who scored proficient or better in math and the lowest percent who scored proficient or better in reading. Only 5% of Detroit public school 8th graders were proficient or better in math. Only 7% in reading. In the Cleveland public schools, only 11% of 8th graders were proficient or better in math and only 10% in reading. In the Baltimore schools, public schools, mind you, um, may as well say pubic, but whatever. Only 11% were proficient in or better in math, and only 13% were proficient or better in reading. In the Fresno School Public Schools, only 11% in math, and only 14% in reading. That really sucks. Wow. Among the states, or, or among the states, Louisiana public elementary schools did the worst in teaching students math, and New Mexico public elementary schools did the worst job teaching reading. In Louisiana public schools, only 19% of 8th graders were proficient or better in math and 25% in reading. In New Mexico public schools, only 24% proficient or better in math or in reading, and 20% in math. Wow. Now, the Department of Educraption's National Center for Educraption Statistics describes what it means to be proficient in math and reading. Eighth graders performing at a proficient level should understand the connections between fractions, percents, decimals, and other mathematical topics such as algebra and functions. Students at this level are expected to have a thorough understanding of basic level arithmetic operations and an understanding 
sufficient for problem solving in practical situations, as in counting back change or figuring out change. Welcome to McDonald's. Don't give me a $10 bill and the change because I'll totally freak. And they do. Trust me, they do. I had someone today with that. Just give me a dollar. Just give me a dollar back. That's all you got to do. I gave you the change. Just give me a dollar. <sighs> so, when it comes to reading 8th grade, students performing at a proficient level should be able to provide relevant information and summarize main ideas and themes. They should be able to make and support inferences about a text, connect parts of a text, and analyze text features. Students performing at this level should also be able to fully substantiate judgments about content and presentation of content. The NAEP math and reading score, uh, tests are scored on a scale of 0 to 500, and the average reading score for an 8th grade public school student on the 2017 NAEP test was 265. That's barely over half. Barely. That's slightly above the average score of 264 that the 8th grade um, achieved in 2015, but slightly below the average score of 266 public school 8th graders um, achieved in 2013. The average math score for an 8th grade public school student in 2017 NAEP test was 282. That's slightly above the average score of 281 of 2015 and slightly less than the average score of 284 in 2013. So, obviously, public education is just that. It is crap. And a lot of this, wait, whoa, what came in? Common Core, that's right. Common Core. Hey, okay. There was one more place I wanted to go. Let me check this out real quick here. Go check out the anti-media. I've been following them over on Twitter, and they've got some really interesting stuff. So, um, let's see, what do they have? Japan won't move embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Oh, darn. Let's see. Okay. Where's your health news, boys? I'm really starting to kind of sort of get into this whole... I know where I was going to go. I know where. Let me see if I can get through this before the end of my time. Ah, it's not long. Okay, this is from the intuitive scribe um, dot blogspot dot com. It's from March of last year, and it's entitled "Filter the Noise." So, don't be frustrated. Talk without action is just noise. So beat the noise. Many talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. Sensual thinking is the intuitive way that we filter the noise and connect with action. Skills like seeing beauty, tasting food, smelling um, change, and hearing lies are intuitive muscles. Sensual thinking exposes what's real and what's not. So when you're aware of what you sense, you are vibrant, focused, and clear. Intuition is the whisper of the soul directing you to recognize progress you cannot see. 
the intuitive perspective refreshes your mind with a nudge or a gut feeling and it keeps you resilient on the path of personal purpose sensuality isn't aggressive it's the power of a gentle touch intuition tells you what to do it's not a negative or judgmental you feel a nudge or the hair on the back of your neck goes up and ultimately you choose destiny now sensual thinking is natural focus that nourishes the spirit and detoxes the mind your intuitive tools are filters that bring confidence to your thinking things are always changing and there is no need to memorize answers because you can keep an open mind be curious and sense what feels right so where the, um, when there is a lot of information the mind tends to wander and sensing keeps your mind engaged with the present and the big picture in focus Fen senses and intuitive tools create bridges of inspiration and good judgment so natural sensuality exposes connections where we tune to energy around us to know what and who to be involved with and who to avoid. Intuition is energy that drives action from something deep inside. We call it many things like the soul or passion or inspiration or gut feeling. Your sixth sense filters the moments you send or the moment to send you doing being finding opening leaving or affirming what feels true at your core sensual thinking is being true to yourself so thinking with our senses constantly refreshes enthusiasm for the truth freedom and love everything we sense has a purpose listen to hear what's real you're always the sum of your potential be very awake and filter out the noise that muffles your passions also share eye contact and laugh more because life is short sense the clarity of honor and character close your eyes and think of peace remember what you see large-scale challenges are solved with a big-picture perspective and you are part of that whole picture so no matter what's happening the music plays on and we're always dancing tell your dreams to the shining stars there's something holy deep inside you so have courage take action thriving is never passive and basically what that means is with everything you see out there you'll know that kernel of truth you'll know it when you hear it you'll feel it you just have to filter out all the BS that's built up around it and that's basically what the quote unquote they do they give you because if they don't give you um, at least an inkling of truth some truth in there your your bullshit meter is gonna be going off like crazy so they always build everything on at least one kernel of truth at least one and um, your job is to listen to your gut to listen to your intuition to see how it feels because if it makes you feel uncomfortable odds are there's a massive lie going on here and that's your inner letting you know excuse me bullshit -o meter just pegged out so learn to recognize that Uh, let's see um. <laughs> oh 
one finance news. Oh, I'm I'm looking over here on alternativenews.com. The feds claim that buying and selling large amounts of Bitcoin without a license is illegal in the United States due to money transmitting business regulation laws. I thought they said that it was all poo poo and uh, there's no such critter. So, um, Mm -hmm. uh, looking, I'm looking at Health Ranger, EPA, FDA building their own. Ooh. Okay. How about. <sighs> I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Oh my goodness, I'm looking in their weird news section. Apparently an insane feminist goes on national TV to claim women can do no wrong and all men are toxic. Really, honey? Apparently you haven't had a good man. Hmm, was that sexist of me? I think so. Okay, I gotta go here. Just because I simply think that hospitals is where people go to die. I don't like hospitals, in case you haven't noticed. This is from NewsTarget.com. Um, how hospitals keep their patients sick by feeding them Ensure, a junk food nutrition shake. Once upon a time, long, long ago, doctors used to take some time to educate their patients on how to maintain a healthy body and mind through nutrition and stress reduction. Unfortunately, a horrible and evil monster invaded the land. Let's call it Fraudzilla. And it decided that this idea of nutrition was nonsense and that people's ills were better managed through synthetic and toxic medications created in a lab. Since the lure of money was so promising, top doctors took the bait and abandoned all common sense and logic with regards to helping patients overcome chronic health problems. It was the beginning of the end for quality health care. As this method of medicine became ingrained in nearly all areas of the world, Doctors became busy pill pushers, and any semblance of nutrition advice went out the door, along with the patient's chances of a solid recovery. Then came the final death blow. In their infinite wisdom, hospital staff started endorsing their flagship recovery product to any patient who needed some serious help so they could get a leg up on recovery. However, this recovery product was of no help at all, and for many, it created their final curtain call. For anyone with any common sense, it's about to become crystal clear why hopes of recovery from illness are virtually destroyed when this nutrition shake is taken as part of the antidote. The nutrition shake that wasn't? Well, before the ingredients were unveiled for this very popular nutrition shake, keep in mind that these formulas could make a healthy person sick. So try to fathom what it would do to someone who's already very sick. It's not pretty. So lo and behold, the nutrition shake commonly recommended to sick and desperate patients is insure. And the ingredients are water, corn, maltodextrin, sugar, milk protein concentrate, blend of vegetable oils, canola, which is rapeseed oil, R-A-P-E-C oil, and corn oil, soy protein isolate, non-fat non milk, less than 0.5% of magnesium phosphate, potassium citrate, 
natural and artificial flavors, cellulose gel, salt, calcium carbonate, calcium phosphate, chlorine chloride, um, ascorbic acid, sodium citrate, cellulose gum, potassium chloride, monoglycerides, soy lecithin or lecithin, carrageenan, potassium hydroxide, liquid sucralose, ferrosulfate, zinc sulfate, as asulfame, asulfame, potassium, DL alpha tocopherol acetate, wow, um, niacinamide, magnesium sulfate, calcium pantho uh, pantothenate or pentothenate, um, copper sulfonate, thiamine, thiamine chloride, hydrochloride, uh, pyrodoxine hydrochloride, vitamin A, palmitate, or vitamin A palmitate, riboflavin, chromium chloride, folic acid, biotin, sodium mol um, sodium molybate, uh, potassium iodine, sodium selenate, uh, phylloquinone, vitamin D3, and vitamin B12. Now, all of those last, you know, the last like 50 bazillion things that were wild ass less than 0.5 percent. So in the analysis, the first ingredient, water, would seem to be fine on the face of it until you realize that the probability of this water being properly filtered is very low, which means you're drinking dirty water, most likely the equivalent to tap water. Yay. And a lot of big cities have nasty tap water. The second ingredient is corn uh, maltodextrin, which is high glycemic GMO ingredient with little to no nutritional value. The third ingredient, sugar, speaks for itself. Number one thing someone who is very sick should avoid. The fourth ingredient is milk protein concentrate, which may seem helpful for some, but when you consider the allergic effects the mucus that milk creates in the body, it immediately becomes a health hazard. It's also uh, got GMO residue from cows being predominantly fed corn. As for, um, as we get further into the ingredients, we see more GMOs like canola, corn, soy, um, artificial flavors, toxic thickeners, artificial sweeteners, and a myriad of isolated and synthetic vitamins and minerals that are poorly absorbed. Yes, folks, this is supposed to help with recovery from illness. So do you see the problem now? But wait, perhaps you haven't been recommended Ensure, but the Boost Shake instead. Well, a quick look at their primary ingredients shows water, corn syrup, sugar, milk protein concentrate, vegetable oils of canola, corn, and sunflower. Perhaps in the effort to save face, they have halfway down the ingredient list stevia leaf extract. But this is a far cry from turning this formula into anything that facilitates recovery. So the good news is, there are a few bona fide nutritional formulas out there that actually remove all the harmful ingredients and put together a bounty of healthy or highly nutrition um, whole foods in a condensed, not isolated vitamins and minerals format that's easily absorbed by the body. This is exactly what anyone recovering from illness needs. And that the same goes for anyone who wants to avoid the hospital in the first place. An ounce of prevention is certainly worth a pound of cure. So if you or someone you love is dealing with sickness and need a simple recovery drink, please avoid these commonly hospital recommended nutritional shakes. Instead, focus on the nutrient-dense, highly digestible superfood powders that can be easily mixed into juice, water, or even a smoothie. And if you, get, you need to get a high-quality source, like the Health Ranger's Fermented Super 30, which will provide the nutrients required for the healthy recovery. Remember, nutrition is paramount to your health and overcoming any challenges you may face. So make it a daily habit to flood your body with optimal nutrition. 
and should you come down with an illness, be wary of nutrition shakes offered by hospital staff and choose whole food nutrition instead. So, leaving you on a healthful, happy note. Thank you all for listening in. You've been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 3, also on the myriad of RLM channels all over the interwebs, that cybernetic superhighway. I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of Grammy's Rocket Chair. Also be sure to check out Vinny and his Ponder Gander Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Noon Central Time. That's my time zone. Ha 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 ha. Cosmic time. So, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening, and I will catch you on the flip side. But please remember that I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.